The murder of the development chief of Ademang last Thursday dawn is said to have brought some easy calm to some uneasy calm to the Masaman community here in the Greater Accra region. The murder of Ni Tete Saba, Saba is believed to be linked to a feud over land. The deceased was, uh, was with a retinue of chiefs performing some purification rites at the Ademang schoolhouse when some unknown assailants attacked them, shooting sporadically. A visit to the schoolhouse, schoolhouse Monday morning revealed about four bullet holes in a section of the building's walls and a blood-stained floor in the room where the chief was murdered. It is a rainy morning at Ademan, at Amasaman. But these women who live in one of the houses here on the compound of the community schoolhouse are standing outside. They are still in a state of shock. Their relative has been brutally murdered. These women were in the house when the exchange of fire started and the chief was killed. The red bands hanging loosely on the poles here give an indication of what happened last Thursday. This 30 year old man was at a community schoolhouse when the tags stormed the compound and started shooting sporadically. His son was shot in the chest and is currently on admission at the 37 military hospital. The local chief, however, did not survive the attack. We are about to start the purification rites when some land guards stormed the stool house and started shooting. We all ran away to seek refuge in one of the rooms belonging to one of our grandparents. We started calling all the people who managed to escape to see if they were safe. When we called the Tete Saba, he was not responding. We called him until the call did not go through anymore. Around 5 a.m., we realized the land guards had killed him. One of my sons was also shot in the chest. The walls of the stool house bear about three bullet holes. The room where the local chief was murdered is also stained with blood. These stains can be seen on the floor, the bed sheets, and on the walls. The Jane Kotoku police have started investigations into events leading to the murder. At the time of our visit, about four police vehicles were patrolling the area. Also, the Tamale Metropolitan Police Command is claiming a major breakthrough in its investigations into increased breakings in the city with the arrest of five suspects. A pistol, daggers, sharp knives were among some implements retrieved from the homes of the suspects. Metro Police Commander Superintendent Dinam Zoeku says the criminals engaged in the breakings appear to have stepped up the operations during the month of Ramadan and targeted some specific communities. Superintendent Dinam tells Joe News about 24 cases have been reported in just three months. Breaking matters are becoming so frequent in communities which we have regarded as flashpoints. These are areas where break-ins are quite high now. In a week, we get not less than two. So the past three months, you can imagine, four uh, by two by three, okay? So that will be about 24 the past three months. He said the police traced one of the items stolen last Thursday to the house of one of the suspects, Habib Abdul Kudus, where a pistol was also found. We were able to identify the house where these stolen items were being kept. And we tracked to that house, we went and conducted search, and we were able to retrieve the stolen properties. The first time we got to the place, uh, we got two people in the room, we brought them to the police station. Several search in the room did not disclose the, the whereabouts of the items. But when we came back to the office here, and then we did another tracking, we got to know that no, we have to go back to that same place. And we went this time when we intensify our search, we were able to locate where these stolen items were hidden. Surprisingly enough, we were also able to land on some weapons. We got a pistol, some knives, you know, the knives, well sharpened knives and daggers, all pointing to the fact that, and even some unspent uh, ammunition were all retrieved from this very guy's um, uh, premise.
Findings from a media public investigation has uncovered irregularities in admissions and financial transactions at the Tepa Nursing and Midwifery Training College in Ashanti region. Love News checks reveal, among others, shady deals. In fuel administration by management is diverting huge sums of state funds into private pockets. Erasmus Sarodonko is one of the media and public interest individuals who has been following developments in the school. Ministry of Health payment vouchers cited by Love News, for instance, show the principal, Victoria Amwa, spent 29,150 Ghana cities as travel expenses for herself and a driver. The figure excludes cost of fuel for three official trips to Accra. A journey to Accra by the principal and her driver on 5th January 2016 to collect scratch cards for the school cost 19,450 Ghana cities minus fuel. On another payment voucher, expenses for similar day's journey to Accra by the principal on 13th January 2016 was quoted at 6,700 Ghana cities besides fuel. Other visits captured featured 3,000 Ghana cities, personal expenses to Accra. Fuel vouchers intercepted also show Miss Amwa and college accountant Richard Asamwa together draw 240 gallons of fuel as state expense every month from Star Oil Company. This is contrary to documents cited by Love News, which indicate the principal is entitled to a monthly fuel allocation of 20 gallons, vice principal 7 and 5 gallons per month for the accountant. Investigations also reveal hundreds of fake receipts issued to cover non-refundable interview and results verification fees paid by applicants between 2012 and 2016. Students have been demanding the whereabouts of over 52,000 Ghana cities they paid as matriculation fees. The students allege, though each of them paid 50 Ghana cities between 2011 and 2015, they were never matriculated, neither has the money been refunded to them. Tepa Nursing and Midwifery Training School has been without a board for over three years. Ms. Amwa stands accused of taking unilateral decisions in admissions, allocation of resources in a manner concerned stakeholders say is not transparent. Public interest advocate Dr. Ernest Kwako points to evidence of admission procedures fraught with bribery and other fraudulent deals. For instance, applicants who failed to make interview selection criteria managed to gain admission over more qualified ones. A development levy of 170 Ghana cities supposed to be charged annually is slapped on students twice a year with little to show for a school which lacks many teaching and learning materials. Now, at home side, Wusudoma, a suburb of Oinda Volta region, have been submerged following a three hour downpour Monday morning. A culvert on the whole Aflau Road, which connects the drainage system in the town, could not contain the high volume of floodwater, causing it to spill onto the road and subsequently into homes and businesses. A report by Fred Kwamiasar. The flood caused vehicular traffic, held up pupils who travel by foot to school and destroyed some maize and cassava farms. Some small businesses, including this hairdressing saloon, were severely affected. The owner, Rose Lechut, lamented, one of her hair dryers and other gadgets have been washed away. <laughs> Joy News also visited some homes situated along the overflowing drains. Residents here explained they acted swiftly by parking their belongings. <laughs> they stressed they suffer each time it rains because the culvert is too small for the high volume of flood water. No one over the gutter, but about the gutter, had our bridge our car. A bigger culvert must be constructed to contain the large volume of running water to prevent overflow. Last year, a contractor brought some fuel construction materials and extended the top slab of the culvert to prevent the water from flowing over onto the road. 
Unfortunately, just after three days of completing work, the flood occurred again and the culvert was destroyed. The assembly member for the area, Anthony Bruce, said he drew the attention of the assembly about three years ago, but only reinforcement work was done on the culvert instead of expanding it. I and my community members were here, we confronted the engineer and the contractor mm -hmm. that what they are doing to know how to solve the problem. But they insist that they are protecting the existing road. Mm -hmm. So there's no funding to do a newly constructed bridge. We knew whatever is happening here, the entire whole town drainage have been channeled to this very bridge. How can this very small covet contain it? It can't contain it. It can't contain it. So they should do a proper uh, bridge. He, however, advised the affected residents to relocate in the interim while attempts are made to curb the flooding. The residents have, meanwhile, made known their intentions to embark on a peaceful demonstration if the culvert is not expanded to prevent the perennial flooding of the area. We're watching Joy News Prime and we're taking a break, but still to come in the bulletin. Elsewhere, hundreds of people have been rendered homeless in several communities along Ghana's coast, a strong waves of merge homes and claim at least one life will be across the country to bring you those reports. And then join News gets up close and personal with a central region school where pupils are found improvising with stones as their computer mounts during an ICT lesson. Double click. Stay tuned for we'll that with all that and more. Now, the government says it will need the support of local and foreign investors to salvage the country's coastal communities ravaged by perennial strong sea waves, which often destroy property and in some instances claim lives whilst at it. It follows the latest wave of destruction, which has left many homeless in part of Adai in the Greater Accra region, as well as in the Volta, Westing and Central regions. The National Disaster Management Organization is currently touring some of the affected communities to distribute relief um, items and we're getting onto the uh, phone line now to speak with uh, some of our correspondents across the country along these coastal communities to bring us up to speed with exactly what the problem is. Let's uh, go to uh, the Volta region where we have Matilda von der Gans. She's actually traveling with a team from the National Disaster Management Organization. Hello Matilda, what have you been able to, what have you found out in your tour of these affected communities? So, Ijol, I am currently at Lekusu here in the Volta region where over 1,506 uh, residents have been displayed following yesterday's tidal wave. As we speak now, I'm on the school premises, the RC uh, school, where most of these uh, affected residents are putting up here, and several of them with their families are here as part of the provisions that have been made by the assembly for them. So most of them are here with their families and uh, they are going to be here until uh, the situation normalizes that they are currently placed. Now, what arrangements have been made for them? Are they getting any relief items at all? Uh, so for these residents, in, any, uh, in some few minutes, uh, not more, will be distributing some relief items to them, which will uh, include uh, mattresses, buckets, and all that for them, at least as part of uh, temporary measures for these uh, residents. But what most of them are appealing for is uh, relocation, because for them, they are used to this uh, tidal wave, and it appears to be a ritual thing for them. So they are, are, are seeking for a more a permanent solution to address the situation in Israel. But it appears it's a divided uh, suggested because some of them still are willing to move out of this place. Others are also complaining that most of them here are fishmongers and some of them are uh, 
fishermen so if they have to relocate from this place it means their jobs are going to be on the line as well so uh, that is some of the concerns they already raised. but immediately they are grateful that some of these relief items are already coming in but they want a permanent solution to this situation Isha. all right so we know that uh, these areas where you're touring currently they're going to be getting some relief items but what's the plan for the rest of the communities along the coast that have been affected, central region and uh, other parts. Uh, so for this morning, uh, we were this afternoon we were at Adan, uh, Adan where similar situation has been uh, recorded there too. Uh, for these areas, uh, uh, relief items have been sent there, like here too. Most of them have already received these relief items. Uh, I understand that the, the NADMO will continue its for assessment for uh, the central region and then the western region tomorrow as well to assess the situation for themselves. But uh, immediately, what they are giving out to each resident are relief items. But uh, government is still considering a relocation plan and also uh, continuing the sea defense projects that at some point was halted. So uh, these are the two in the long-term intervention that government is considering, though uh, they are yet to give concrete uh, details on it. Right, well, thank you very much, uh, Matilda Bwamega. Let's get over now to the central region where we have Richard Kojonyaku uh, on the line. And uh, Richard, in your area, we're told that one person, at least one person, uh, is dead. What can you tell us about the latest situation? Well, uh, that is a 52-year-old man, and he died um, three days ago, and they performed a lot of rituals. And so at dawn today, uh, the body uh, was found on the shore, and so the body has been deposited at the Central Regional Hospital, the Cape Coast Region Hospital. What is happening currently is that the fishermen and the fishmongers are afraid of uh, plying their trade, the fishermen see that the strong winds that are coming, if they do not take care, they might also get drowned and a lot of disasters would happen. As, uh, as of this morning, they had begun uh, counting their costs, but there, was, uh, there were no signs of NADMO or other officials who are going to that place. But at Saw Pond and at Anchor Pond near Saw Pond, the Deputy Minister of Fisheries, Asukujo, uh, paid a visit to the community and has been assessing the extent of damages to the canoes at saw pond about uh, 10 canoes were destroyed in cape coast about um 14 canoes were destroyed and along the coastal belt others other communities were also affected and so they are waiting and we hear that nadmo from the national headquarters will be visiting these areas uh, to see the kind of relief items they will be giving them all right uh, richard now this 52 year old man you said uh, was killed how did his death happen? Is it that his home was washed away or what? Well, they were on a fishing expedition, but when they realized that the, the wind was becoming stronger and stronger, they decided to go to Elmina for, um, to uh, bet their canoes. And in the process, they were four in number. And in the process, he got drowned. They did a lot of effort. A lot of effort went into it in uh, getting him out of the sea, but, I mean, they all uh, proved uh, fruitless. But three of them managed to swim ashore, and so um, that is how come he died. Uh, a lot of the family members are devastated because they say that he is the breadwinner of the family. He goes uh, on fishing expedition and will provide them their, their meals. But now that he is no more, they fear they might not be able to live longer than uh, the normal thing. All right, thank you very much, uh, Richard Kojoni. I can bring us up to speed with the situation in the central region. Now, let's go back to the uh, Volta region where we have Ivy Setsoji. She's in another part of the region, and she's been following this uh, strong wave phenomenon all, all weekend. Hello, Ivy. Tell us about it's the level of distraction exact where you are. Uh, currently, I'm in Blekusu uh, in the Kettis uh municipality, uh, we are actually uh, at the premises of the Blefusu uh, Catholic School. Uh, okay. where the now, affected... this community, this is the same community where we're told that the NADMO boss is coming, right? Exactly. The NADMO, uh, the director general, is um, here with the residents interacting with them uh, right now, waiting, awaiting the arrival of the relief items uh, to be distributed among the affected residents. The residents are putting up in the 
uh, just cool for the meantime until help uh, comes and so something is done uh, to, to make them go back to their various homes. So that is what is happening right now at Blekusu. Now, you earlier reported that the, the schools in the area had to be closed. Are they still closed for yes, these the people school, to use as a school, shelter? Exactly. The schools are closed now. For the meantime, that is the Blekusu uh, RC school and that of Hovi. Uh, they are closed for now. Uh, so residents can put up. Right now, the residents are here. Uh, some of them are cooking. Uh, some of them are doing other things. And the Director General of NADMO is also interacting with uh, some of the students uh, to, to know the, what is going on as we wait for the relief items to be brought. All right, Ivy, I can imagine it's late and uh, it's around time, it's about time people will be having their baths. Where are they having their baths? Oh, <clears throat> that is a problem. Right now, even the place is very dark. Uh, there's no light on, on the premises. Uh, the school has no light. Uh, so cars uh, use their lights to, to make people see. So right now, we don't know where they are, they are going to have their baths. But according to some of them we spoke to earlier, as they said, they will have to wait so it is a little uh, late, maybe from 9 o'clock there about, so they can, maybe that time some people will be sleeping, then they can go and have their bath at, 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 at the back of uh, the, the, the school building. Uh, for the children, most of them have had their bath and eaten. Um, they are in their rooms, but the mosquitoes uh, is also something else is disturbing. And so right now, uh, the residents, some of them are outside uh, trying to uh, get some fresh air uh, because even when you get inside, mosquitoes are there. Uh, they don't have coil uh, to, you know, prevent that. Uh, so right now, uh, they are just scattered around here. But some of the children are inside uh, the room sleeping. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ivy Setsoji. And uh, as you heard, the residents there who are displaced at the moment would be needing uh, some mosquito net so if the appropriate agencies could get in there and help them or assist them or probably not more themselves meanwhile minister for works and housing samuel atanchia says the capital intensive nature of the investment that will be needed to save these coastal communities will be too much for government alone to take up and he's urging local and foreign investors to come pitch in can we say that the government will have a good synergy with this bank and say that, like, look, we are, we are being threatened by the sea. Let's get some more people to come and do the sea defense, and then they'll be paid. That is where we should go. But in all these things, we have, should bear in mind that there is an extent that you can't commit the government in terms of the IMF strictures. These are some of the matters which become imperative that if the bank will give concessionary lending arrangements, then we can do good business. But when the need arises, won't you go for the IMF to review some of their constraints? Well, it is happening in the pipeline, but I don't want to discuss these matters now. But for sure, the Akufuado government is on the verge of ensuring that anything which will lower the standards of Ghana will be removed. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break, but we have business news coming after. After, please don't go away. Hello again, good evening to you and welcome to business. Private firms account for a chunk of loans that banks fear might not be paid back on time. That's according to the latest banking sector report by the Bank of Ghana. George Uafe has more in the following report. The Bank of Ghana report puts the total non-performing loans as at April this year at around 7.15 billion Ghana cities, representing a 24.5% increase from the 5.74 billion Ghana cities in April 2016. According to the report, the private sector share of the 7.15 billion Ghana cities stock of non-performing loans was 97%, representing an increase of about 11%. Most of these loans that have not been paid back on time was held by firms operating in commerce and finance sector. It was believed that government was the biggest cause of this problem, which has led to the high interest rates being charged by commercial banks. But the Bank of Ghana report shows that it was rather 
the private sector. The inability of these firms to pay back the loans on time has actually resulted in some high interest rates, which the bank have argued that they had to share the cost with potential borrowers. However, some of the private firms have also argued that their inability to pay these debts is due to government indebtedness to them, as a lot of them have also rendered services to the state the government has delayed in paying them. Activities of the Ghana Stock Exchange is expected to witness a rebound after last week's setback. Some analysts say the city may remain stable against the other major trading currencies, while the commodities market is expected to record mixed results with cocoa likely to continue shedding some value investments. And stock market analyst Aseya Kotia has been assessing the performance of the market as well as the outlook. After block trades, usually you have the market cooling off. Um, it's a natural phenomenon with the market. The market cools off a bit before you have a lot more activity coming up. So it's not that entirely strange. It was very expected. And so we saw that, as, as I said earlier last week. Um, this week, after cooling off, there's a new trading week. Investors are back. Um, major investors who saw the block trade and try to get reasoning behind the block trades have made decisions as to what to invest in and what not to invest in, and hence the activity for this week. Cow Bank Limited ended last week very strongly and started this week also on a very positive note. Sunday Chartered Bank also was telling last week, and this week also we're expecting nothing different from that. Um, in terms of the losers, last week we had the likes of Bob and the Ghana Commercial Bank shedding off some value. They still have excess supply on the market even as we speak. So we expect this week also to be relatively stable for such stocks and uh, most likely they'll dip again this week. Still in the quarter in which we issued a $2.25 billion bond. And also last week we had about $700 million coming in with a lot of participation from non-resident investors. And so we still do have a good amount of dollars in the system, uh, hence the relative stability of the CD. Um, however, against the pound and the euro, the CD has gained some ground, especially against the pound. So against the pound and the euro, the CD seems to gain some, some value. Meanwhile, the stock market analyst with Nordia Capital, Aseya Kotia, says the Ghana alternative market guts will see significant capitalization should government agree to add infusion drugs to the list of banned drugs to be imported into the country. Local pharmaceutical companies have recently advocated for such an inclusion. Market analyst Aseya Kotia says this will engender increased investments on the bears. When you hear market players pushing for a policy drive like this. Um, it's good for the local investor. First of all, it's good for the local company and for investors in that company as well as a place to watch. Um, if indeed the policymakers heed to this cry and they go this way, it will mean that there will be a big market, a very huge market for Intravitos Ghana, and that will reflect very much in the, the financials or the figures in the near future. So it's, it's, I expect investors to keep their eyes on the ball mm -hmm. and keep their, their, their ears closely sticking to the, the policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, if they get wind of anything that's going to happen in that direction, I would expect every investor to really get All on right. the wagon and purchase a, a stock like that. Away from that, recent tidal wave developments in some parts of the central and western regions have dealt a devastating blow to coastal communities and affected some business activities along the coast. Here in Accra, Sheila Tamaklu visited the La Landing Beach site along the coast and reports that fishing and some constructing activities have been badly affected by the recent climatic conditions. Over the weekend, I'm sure you've heard stories of how there has been constant um, erosion, coastal erosion from Keta, Ada, and some other coastal areas. Currently, I'm at Labadi, and as you can see behind me, the tidal waves are quite strong, and they keep coming much more into the seashore lines. As you can see, it's eroding, it's gradually, and coming in. So I'm here, and I'm going to speak to some of the community members as to how this is affecting their livelihood and their businesses, seen as fishing is the major source of livelihood for these community members. Kanshon <laughs> 
So according to him, formerly the sea, as you can see, was way behind. The shoreline was much stretched compared to what you are seeing today. So due to this, each time it rains, it kind of brings rubbish to the seashore like we are seeing currently. And because of the way it has advanced into their sea, into onto the shore, they have to also drag their boats way back to avoid it being carried off when the rain comes down. So according to Mr. Emmanuel here, he also says that the water keeps coming into the seashore and it has eroded the land over the years. However, they also like government to consider coming up with some form of a sea defense to block and help keep their shore safe. It's not just going to help them to stop the water from coming further, but then he believes that it's also going to block the plastics from getting onto the seashores because it's a big disturbance and a nuisance to them as a community. Moving down the Labadi coastal line, it is clear that the issue of the coastal erosion not only affects their livelihood, but then also investments. Like this um, edifice that we see behind us, it's a million dollar high rise building. But then this project has stalled as it's sitting precariously close to receded um, coastal lines and it threatens the very foundations of this building. What then can we do to be able to forestall such situations? Well, over the years, government has invested in some sea defense projects, like the $60 million sea defense project in Sakumono and that of the Keta and Ada areas. But then more needs to be done and more investment has to be done in the management of our sea lines. Or else the question will become what remains the fate of such investments and such high-rise buildings along our coastal lines. Reporting for Joy Business, Sheila Tamaklu. And that will be it for business tonight. Many thanks for your time and many thanks for watching. My name is Imano Apuachi Yafi. Have a good evening. The opposition National Democratic Congress says it will be redesigning its policies and messages so it can win over more middle class voters. Speaking on Joy News about the party's 25th anniversary celebrations evening as it prepares to rejuvenate its rank and file after a heavy defeat in the 2016 general election, General Secretary John Singh Seydun Ketia conceded the party has lost the influential middle class voters to its main rival, the governing New Patriotic Party. Uh, Mr. Seydun Ketia, who was speaking on the poll, said contrary to the widely held perception that he does not see eye to eye with the NDC's founder. He has nothing against him. He however says he will continue to resist any attempts to subvert the party's resolutions on issues which in some instances may run contrary to the wishes of former President Rawlings. I disagreed with him on issues and I have, such, as, and I have, such as selecting of candidates and, and many other things and I have stuck to the party's uh, uh, constitution. I, I, I have disagreed with President uh, Lewis, mm. and I have stuck to the party's constitution. I have disagreed with President Mahama, and I have stuck to the party's constitution because, look, everybody, when the president, uh, any of the three presidents, it, when they were elected as flag bearers, they saw by our party's constitution, but that is supreme. When I was elected as a general secretary, I saw by the party's constitution. So if a matter comes up and I say that, look, this is the party, this is what our boss, that is the party's constitution, says, so I will not depart from it. I will insist that we go by I'm it. I'm particularly uh, 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 disrespect. And I'm happy that all the three big men has at one point in time or the other found that they found, it, found it to be uh, very difficult. But fortunately, I have never had any case filed in any court in Ghana <laughs> uh, calling into question decisions that we have taken and I have lost that case. I'm particularly interested <laughs> in you holding tight to the, uh, the party's constitution. Sure. Uh, are you then suggesting that uh, ex-president Rawlings wasn't following the party's constitution? We are not saying that in generality, but there were certain activities that decisions that had to be taken. 
and the position he espoused and decisions, uh, decisions the, like decisions about the selection of candidates, for instance. Okay, what did he want? I have what was his proposal? I don't think that I don't think that we have to go into those things. But I'm saying that we have, yes. I have had occasion where uh, maybe he has suggested that a particular person should be made a candidate in a particular area. And, and you find and that so in the the position of the of Constitution? Allah has said that the Constitution, uh, uh, the Constitution provides that the people there should go and vote. Whoever emerges is the choice. Who did he know that? that? I have had the same occasion to disagree with President Mills when he also suggested that uh, for certain considerations, certain persons, I, that, that constituency too, I don't want to mention it, uh, must be the candidate. I disagreed. And several big men came to see me to try to convince me about the, the prudence of that decision. And I said, that, look, I am to follow the law. So if you don't want us to go this way, go and change the law first. Because I'm not going to breach the law for my judgment to be called into question. Mm. How does it come across to you that the founder finds you to only abide, uh, abide by the constitution in parts that only suit you and uh, rather diverting from the party's values? Well, I'm saying that, uh, you see, there are, there, there, there are also subjected to some pressures, as all of us are subjected to. So if your leader is subjected to some pressures, and he cannot defy those pressures, and he tries to get you to do something that is against the law, or against the Constitution, you will be helping him in insisting that the law should prevail. You understand? So if you also bend and yield, to the wrong thing being done. Mm. And later the accusation goes to him that it is because of him that this thing which should have gone this way uh, according to the, the party's laws went this way because of his intervention. We are hurting him, we are not helping him. NDC General Secretary was the butt of a joke by the founder last Saturday when former President Rawlings told the rally that he would have been a wonderful black bearer had he not been ugly. Oh, sir. John Mahama is not the only kiki man here. <laughs> when uh, General Mosquito Bayer, I want a Mahuse or Nuzia Kikimba. Sir, time to draw. It's a pity no hoon yafe. No hoon yafe. No hoon yafe. All right, just to paraphrase what he said, he said uh, if it's a pity that General Mosquito or well, the general secretary is not handsome. If he was handsome, if we got to the time when we were running for the flag bearership, he would have, uh, if he had been put on, he would, uh, on the horse, the proverbial horse, he would have uh, made a fantastic um, horse racer or jockey or a candidate. Now, responding to the joke, Mr. Sedun Ketia said, much as he found it funny, he believed it was an endorsement of his contribution to the NDC. Uh. Uh, no, I'm the general secretary now, so let me do my work as a general secretary for the time being. I don't combine two things. But uh, it was, it, it created some comic relief. The comment of our founder created some comic relief and it enlivened the environment. Yeah, it really yeah. means to what he said. It yeah. just, uh, it's just one word, saying that you'll be a perfect candidate for the NDC. Mm. Um, have you thought if about... If I were fat and... <laughs> <laughs> So but the conditions are impossible to satisfy because <laughs> I can't go back to God. So and you say, have given up. And you say, have given up growing fat and say increase my my, my the size of my tummy or increase my <laughs> height or this thing. I have said that even though this is a comic relief, people are taking it so serious. But you see, we must always look hold people responsible for what they have done as individuals because. And don't blame people for the omissions 
and actions of another entity. Some people can take this to mean that uh, is 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 comparing me with uh, President Mahama. So 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 it can create some problem, even though it is meant to be uh, comic. But it was a good joke which all of us uh, uh, we know loved. But the, 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 what I can glean from it is that it is an endorsement of how I have done my work. And right, so let's listen now to what the General Secretary had to say about the party, the NDC, wooing middle class voters. The middle class has expanded now. The rural population which we are relying on, because of urbanization, it is shrinking. So no party can win election now based on uh, you know, strategies tailored towards the rural population alone. Now the middle class, we have allowed MPP to capture it. The result is that when uh, MPP foot soldiers need support, the petty bourgeois in the middle class will not have to refer to any head office. They can, in their way and in their various constituencies, help solve some petty petty problems and even groom others to go into business okay we have a situation where we have allowed the middle class to be appropriated by mpp we don't we are not strong there in the big businesses we are not there that's a very and serious so, concession yes i'm telling you but that is the reality now so you go down there and then our party people uh, have been relegated into poverty, are food soldiers and so on, and they are not petty bourgeois there who can support our party people on their own without any reference to office. So whenever we are in power, anybody who gets appointed, party people now think that it is their right to be taken care of by that person. How do Deputy Minister for Employment and Labor Relations, Bright Reku Brobe, says it is critical for the country to mobilize adequate resources to empower duty bearers to design, implement, and effectively monitor child labor interventions across the country. According to him, it is, it is possible to eliminate all forms of child labor and also address all fundamental issues bordering the engagement of children in work. He made this statement at the 2017 World Day Celebration Against Child Labor. The annual event is aimed at finding practical ways to mobilize resources to implement the phase two of the National Plan Action on the Elimination of Child Labor. According to latest global estimate, the number of child labor has declined by one third since 2000, from 246 million to 168 million. In Africa, 59 million children between the ages of 5 and 17 are involved in hazardous work. Deputy Minister for Employment and Labor Relations, Bright Rekubrobe, says child labor leads to growing youth unemployment and a decline in labor productivity. According to him, the implementation of the NP2 is critical for the protection of children from all forms of child labor as well as development. Children engaged in child labor are prevented from acquiring basic literacy, numeracy, and other technical and vocational skills, thereby limiting their careers, employability, and future livelihood opportunities as youth and the ability to transition from school into decent work. Child labor also leads to the problem of growing youth unemployment and a decline in labor productivity among the young people. The successful implementation of the MPA2 will avoid repetition of the shortfalls which led to the inability of stakeholders to collectively achieve the main goal of the MPA1. Two, more so, the implementation of the action plan will assure the local community that the government is committed to the fight against child labor through legislations, through policies, programs, initiatives, and national action plans like the MPA2.
On her part, Chief of Staff Akusia Frema Oseo Pari appealed to all to help curb the menace as it deprives the children of their childhood and potential. There are situations where children are being exploited or being put into child labor for atonement of other people's so-called sins. Things that maybe a dead uh, parent or even a, live, a living parent have done or have refused to do. We have also noticed that children can be given as compensation for debt that parents owe. Officer in charge of International Gold Mining Project, Emmanuel Kwame Mensa, says the menace is harmful to the physical and mental development of children. Now, a video showing some pupils practicing how to click a computer mouse with stones during an ICT class has gone viral on social media in the last few days. In the viral video, which we will show you in a bit, the pupils are compelled to improvise with stones because they do not have access to a computer for the lesson. And hold your mouse. <laughs> Double click. Well, join News on Monday, traced the school with the help of social media and paid a visit there to see the true extent of their problems. Central Region Correspondent Richard Kojunyako joined the class six pupils of the Asin Asamankese DA Primary School in the Asin South District and reports on the other ways improvisation has come in handy in their ICT class. I'm here at the Asin Asamankese DA Primary School and this school has Fortunately or unfortunately gone viral uh, because a teacher was seen in the classroom teaching the students how to learn ICT with aid of stones. He was using the stones to help the students to identify what a mouse is, to left click and right click. And then because in the absence of the computer, the teacher would have to improvise. And by improvisation, the teacher decided that there are stones available here. I can see that it is these stones that the students picked, and then each student will pick one stone, and then they will use it as a way of teaching them what a mouse is and how a mouse looks like. This school, when I came in, I saw that it's been ages, been five. We celebrated it last two years. That is 50 years, last two years. But we lack a lot of things about the teaching aids and other things here. So when I came, since I came here, those who were in class two are now in class six. And we haven't had anything like computer that we can use to teach them. So when it came to that way, I saw that since they are going to JHS, they will be writing the exams. So I had to do something so that they will have at least the few. If it's not the right thing, they can do something. So I tried using it so that I told them to imagine. I drew them on the board and told them to imagine how the tennis, so that they will use their hands to touch, to feel, and then do the clicking aspect. So when the, the stone was in, in their hand, I told them they should imagine the left as the left button, and then the right as the right button. And then where they put their hand, being the body of it. So that by so doing, they will know that when they go and they have the feel somewhere, they will be able to identify, or they will be able to know what they have done here. And then sometimes I use my phone, Sometimes I use the phone. Even when it comes to uh, desktop and other things, I use the phone. Because we don't have the red thing, I use the phone to do it for them. Sometimes to, we try to imagine certain things like TV, television and other things. That one, they have them in their home. So when you imagine that, then you tell them this or that, or they try to bring certain things that they see on the television. So while they know the mouse pointer and other things, you draw it on the board and then even when we're doing dragging it or so, <laughs> yeah, 
I drew it on the board and I asked them, put your hand on it, try to click and hold, and then move your hand, just like you are moving icon from one place to the other. How are you all? I'm fine. Okay, so say so they all have their stones. Yes. No sir. You don't have it. I'm in the class six classroom of Asan Asamankese Primary School. And this is the very classroom that Mr. Augustine Kusi used the stone in teaching the students ICT. Today I have my stone and I'm joining the class in learning ICT using the stone. As I told you, the select leg is by pressing the button of the mouse once. Yes. Yes. So we are all going to do it. Second click, yes. Okay. Okay, good. Then the same thing, we are going to use it to click double. That is the double click. Yes, sir. And with this one, this, I said it is what? In quick succession. Huh? Yes, sir. So it's in quick succession. So when you do it, don't just do it like this. Leave your hand and then come again. No. Do it. Make sure you don't click where you use the index finger. Right click. That is your... Okay, so now we are done with how to right click and left click. And so Mr. Augustine Kusi, the class six teacher, is going to teach them how to drag, how to drag um, the mouse. Listen, this is very important. Once you are uh, that is Mr. Augustine Kusi, the class six teacher uh, of the Asena Samankese uh, DA Primary School, teaching the students how to left click, how to right click, and how to even drag an icon on the computer from one place to the other. And I'm told that this is not the only thing he improvises. He has been able to successfully teach the children motherboard is, and then he's taking them out to have a real feel of that place. They've been making constant appeals to authorities for them to even have one computer in order for the children to use. What can you tell me about you using a stone to learn? It's very, it's very nice to learn this ICT. And have you seen a mouse before? Where did you see one? In your house? Yes, sir. Your father or your mom or your brother? My brother. Your brother has a, a computer? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So using this stone to learn, it, is it difficult or it has made it very easy? It has made it very easy. Very easy. Yes. And you're happy about it? Yes, sir. Uh, I want government to give us more. Then right click, left click, double click. It is very easy to use to learn because it is not the real mouse. It's not a real mouse. Yes. So you want a real mouse? Yes. But have you seen a real mouse before? Yes. Where? Where did you see one? My room. I want to tell the government that they should bring computers and mouse here. We don't have some here, so they should bring more. It is easy. It is very easy? Yes, sir. Mm. Why do you say that it is easy? It is very well to use the, this to make a mouse to learn. The first one, as you saw, is the computer. From class one to class six, we don't have one computer in the school. You used to have one damaged one at my office, so during the practical, then they come and you to touch it. Now it's still there, it's just damaged. It's not, it's spoiled, totally spoiled. That way they were using to help the children to see the computer themselves. But now, when I came here, they were using the device and asked them to uh, find a, a means to get one computer in the school. So this is the first uh, step that the teacher took. So we need computers in the school, that one there, it's must, because the topic is from class one to classes, we have to teach ICT. All right, so there's some good news to report. There are apparently some people who have uh, decided that they're going to donate some computers to the school, and so we say thank you to them. Uh, when we get these computers to the schools, we're going to report as well. Now, the other bit I need to add to the story is that um, the teacher, told me, I had a conversation with me, he told me that he actually had one mouse, his own personal mouse that he brought to the class, uh, which he used to demonstrate to the pupils, except because it was just one mouse, he couldn't pass it around for everybody else to uh, have a feel of it. But at least the pupils have seen what a mouse looks like, not the mouse at home, as in like a domesticated mouse or the rat or the, or the pest. 
but they've actually seen a proper mouse. And we have more on this story coming up on Join News Interactive. I'll tell you the backstory of all of it. And, but also in the bulletin, the Oblogo School here in Accra, which was featured on Join News for liking school desks, has received a donation of 200 dual desks. In the story aired two weeks ago, the pupils of the Oblogo 2 and 3 uh, primary school lay on the bare floor to take their notes and do classwork. The situation has ever since improved thanks to the Member of Parliament for the area, Tina Mensa. Martha Krenzel Aqua returned to the school Monday morning and reports though there are more problems, the provision of new desks has brought relief to the pupils. Two weeks ago, I was here to tell you about the story of Oblogo 2 and 3 Basic School here in Accra. Most of the pupils lie on the bare floor to write, but today, the situation has changed. I am here to find out how it has changed teaching and learning. This was the situation at Oblogo 2 and 3 primary schools a fortnight ago. The pupils had few desks and were compelled to sit on the floor, take lessons and do classwork. The pupils did not mince words when Joy News inquired about the situation. Like sometimes when they fix their chest, when they sit on it, they can even hit, they fall down sometimes. And sometimes they sit on the floor. Okay, we don't have this. Any time that we come to school, maybe you fix the desk before you sit on it. Early morning, if you didn't come uh, like, if you do not come to school early, then we move to the other class and go and pick the broken ones before we, fix, we sit on it. We sit on the floor before writing the exams. The situation has dramatically improved with all the pupils having access to a dual desk. What should have been a basic requirement to promote teaching and learning eluded the pupils and they saw that opportunity only as a luxury. We are feeling, we are okay. feeling happy. Happy? What, are, what is making you happy today? And then because the first, when they bring us the desk, it was no good. When you sit down, we, when it is for we can fix it. When you sit down to to respond, then you fell down and you'll be hurt by it. When they bring us the desk, we are happy now, so we are feeling well. So this desk is better than the one you had? Madam, yes, it's better. Okay. But at first, you're telling me sometimes it fix, you fix it and then some people get hurt. Did anybody get hurt in this class? Madam, yes. What happened to him or her? Madam, the deck, some was metal and then some was wood. And then so when you, the, the, the deck spawn, then when you fix it, if you fix it, then you fell down, then the metal, at times, will affect my hand. So when you sit down, it can hurt you. My name is Susanna Mensa. I am in primary four, and I am 11 years old. When I sat on a new desk, I feel good and I can write. Okay, so before, when, before you got the new desk and now, what has changed? Everything has changed in this class, and when we are writing, we write well, and we feel good on our decks. Uh, the time we, we don't have the desk, if you sit down, our clothes will be dirty. Now, if you sit down, our, our clothes don't come dirty again. Today, Ketsi, the Member of Parliament, Tinana Yilimensa, who is also the Deputy Minister of Health, the pupils can comfortably sit, write, and undertake lessons. Thank you very much for bringing this to my notice because you know we just won the elections in January and I wasn't privy to this until you uh, brought the, this thing. The, you made a story out of it. Then I came to see it. I promise I have to do something quickly so that the children can have a better learning uh, environment. And this is what I have done. But the problems of the school are far from over. See, as it started to rain, you can see the stagnant waters all over the place. You ask yourself, where are our children going to even play or even walking to not have a playground? And what is baffling me more is that uh, you can see some structures have been pulled off, and I believe other, something else has to be built on it. The teachers are saying any time any attempt is made for something to be built on it, then the community comes in that it is their park. As you can see, we went to look at the a kindergarten and it is not something that you have to describe as a classroom. It's just a temporary structure that they, 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 our children are in and they are crowded in one classroom. So even if you want to do something, you have to come to a spacious place then you separate them from it. But this, here is a case that they are saying the community doesn't allow 
uh, uh, whatever to be done on it. So I think uh, I, I'll move to the community very soon to talk to the chiefs and the people there that if they want development, then they should allow. The Municipal Education Director for Gas South, Felicia Ejebia Okai, explained how the provision of furniture will enhance teaching and learning. We talk of uh, quality teaching and learning. And to have quality teaching and learning, the children should be well seated, comfortably, and then teaching and learning could go on. Another key issue yet to be resolved is housing for the kindergarten classes. On Joy News visit two weeks ago, the pupils were learning in this poorly ventilated classroom. With the exit of the JHS3 students, they are privileged to occupy the primary six class as a temporary measure. If the assembly is planning to rebuild the place, but as you said, when I also came and I saw it, I quickly moved them to the new building because I realized we have some space in the new building. So with a fine space, I don't know why we should continue to keep them there. So we have moved them and I hope the, the, the situation is under control. Yeah, we're doing our best to fix it permanently. But the pupils have more than a wish to be relocated into an airy classroom. They need more chairs and hope their friends in the other dilapidated structure also get Do you like moved. your new class? Yes. Why do you like your new class? Who will tell me? Yes. It's nice. It's so what do you want more in the class? What else do you want? What else do you want? Who knows what you want? What do you want? I, I want something more. Like what? Like fun. For Joy News, my name is Martha Prince Solakwa, reporting. There's a part of the, well, part of the country are without electricity. And um, so I'm just getting word from Gritco that it has to do with a connection from Cote d'Ivoire to um, Ghana. But they said they're working on it and that the, the lines or power should be restored to the areas that are affected in the next hour. So we're hoping that that get, tends to uh, get to happen. Unfortunately, the people who have been affected will probably will not be watching us. And to, yes, definitely. But, yeah. but of but course, tell a message. friend to tell a friend that that's what Gritko that says. Gritko indicates that the power should be back on in the next hour. And that's it for the bulletin. Thank my you very much, Aisha. And my name is Israel. I have a good night. is Joy News Prime.